ready to go? Yep. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us uh, for the water, water softener valve education. So the goal of this is to teach you guys a little bit about the history of water softeners so that you can understand what products are out there in the marketplace. Uh, once you understand the products on the marketplace, you'll under the, understand maybe the feature, advantage, and the benefits of, of those units. So when you compare them to the newer products that are out there, you have an ability to t teach the customer why is the newer stuff better, what's it going to do, what are the advantages, and then for them they can understand the benefits. The one unit that we are missing, Noe, would you grab that eco water unit and lay it right up over yeah. here, please? We'll scoot it back when we're done. So the evolution of a water softener started with both, uh, I guess it would be Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, mm -hmm. Lindsay and Culligan, they got into the business together back in 19, it's like 1895 to 1902. That's when the first one started. The way they started is water softeners were exchange tanks. So basically, it was an in-out head, and what they would do is they would have a service come by your house, and you'd exchange the tank out and put in a new tank every month, sometimes every week, depending on how hard you want it. We know that the average water softener that we design, we size up, we want to regenerate no, uh, no earlier than every three days. So we really don't want it to go off every other day. In fact, the little bit longer we can go, the better off you have it. But then there's a fine line. You can't go too long because then you get what's called creeping. And that's where the water finds, creates a rut, sort of like a river in a, in a bed of, uh, of clay or, or, or uh, earth. And it creates a rut and then it no longer gets softened. So those units, that's how they began. Uh, those two individuals split one, from one another. Culligan took the approach of staying with a uh, exchange tank because they love that service call and that service revenue, Lindsay came out and created the first control valve. I don't have that control valve for you, but it's basically a control valve. Uh, I think the two of them together created the resin. I don't know if you know that story, Eric. Uh, they together developed and, and uncovered that resin that does the exchange process. Again, the exchange process, just so that we all re remember, is that if this is a water molecule, it basically as the water passes through the filter material, the calcium ion pops off and is replaced with a sodium ion. That's why it's called ion exchange. Again, it's real simple. The calcium, which is bedrock, that's sitting on the water molecule, it's the white crusty film or rock that's attached to the water molecule, as that passes through this tank and they pass, the water passes from the top going down, and you can see in here, the filter material is about <coughs> two thirds high, once it starts filtering through here, the calcium pops off, a sodium ion pops on, and then it comes out of the distributor and off to the house. That little water molecule comes out and it's carrying a little sodium ion. It's very minimum the amount of sodium ion that actually has been exchanged. The reason why people complain about some of these older units is that not only does it have that sodium ion that's attached to it, but these older water softeners, leave a, they overdose this filter bed with excess salt. And they do that because they're overguessing how much salt it needs to clean this filter material. So as a result, uh, as a result, what happens is the bottom of this bed is loaded with, with sodium, and so that mixes with that water molecule and it gets more salty. So then it goes off to the house and people drink it and they're like, wow, my water tastes salty. It tastes crappy. Well, I don't want to drink that. And so Starting in the 60s, probably the 50s, through the 60s, plumbers would plumb the kitchen cold on raw water. Because at that point, these type of valves that were in existence, they would leave so much extra salt on the bottom of this tank uh, because it didn't know how much really to dose. So that a, a dealer like us would program it for 12, 14 pounds of salt. And they would uh, be sitting with an extra amount of sodium down there. And people would be like, I can't stand that you got to get rid of it. So the plumbers would put the kitchen cold only and all the outside silcox on raw water so it didn't go through this. Also what would happen is if they, someone had installed this right at the meter or right at the pressure tank and they didn't bypass the outside silcox, you'd go spray your lawn with this kind of water and over time it would burn it out. 
if you water plants with it, it burn it out. So, so those plants wouldn't live. So that was, this is one of the first similar, or mo most well-produced valves, I think, in America is this, my opinion, is this FLEC 5600 valve. Would you agree? Yes. So 5600 valve is, is, it may very well still be one of the most widely produced valves really in the world because China has now adopted the valve, copied it, and they make it and they sell it back to America to lower end dealers around the Chicago area and around the US who buy this valve and sell it at ridiculously low prices. Again, the newer units, even Fleck now makes this valve in China and sells it back to this market but at a little higher price. So again, the weakness on this is it leaves a lot of salt behind as we we're talking. In addition to that, this control valve, as you can see, is not very heavy duty. Uh, this is a meter assembly, and this is the valve right here. So the valve body is very small. So it tells you something about it is that it reduces water pressure. So this valve, one of the weak points is, as we moved into the 80s and 90s and 2000s, homes are now plumbed with one inch plumbing. The this valve takes a three quarter inch uh, pipe that leads into it, or plumbing pipe, which drops the water pressure down to like nine gallons a minute. The distributor and the valve porting reduces it to a little lower level, somewhere around seven gallons to eight gallons. It's debatable, and in a, in a laboratory environment, they might, without any filter material, they might actually get nine gallons a minute, but in reality, as we see it, we, plumb this, we would plumb this in at a customer's house with one inch plumbing or even three quarter inch plumbing, we'd have complaints about the fact that the water pressure worse. So, you know, there's not much we could have done about it back in the 70s and 80s if we used them. It was really the lion's share of the, the only product on the market. Uh, and by the way, this was manufactured by a company called Fleck. Uh, so if we go step back one second, we had Lindsay and we had Culligan. Culligan eventually created, not only did the exchange tanks, but they eventually created their own valve. Lindsay eventually was bought by EcoWater and their valve systems has evolved greatly and we'll get to that product since they've come full circle and now they make an amazing water softener so everyone knows it. But after uh, Culligan and Lindsay made valves, then another company came along called Fleck and they are now owned by, by the parent company is Pentair. So Fleckenstein invented this type of valve and uh, as they started manufacturing the valve, they, they get, became ginormous. Um, they became, I'm not exactly sure how the name Pantera came into place, but Pantera is the corporate entity. They are the king of the hill. They make more tanks, more valves, more vessels than any other company in the world. They sell to pool supply companies. They sell to manufacturers that need to just have retention tanks. They sell to absolutely everybody, pressure tanks from the pressure tanks of over. Of a, uh, of a well tank, they make well tanks. So they make more fiberglass tanks and valves than I think anyone else in the world. So that said, uh, they are a force to be reckoned with. Their problem, in our opinion, is that they don't go for new technology. As we mentioned, slow water, reduces water pressure and uh, leaves a lot of salt behind. And still this valve will be competed against by a guy out of his, typically a man out of his garage selling this unit. The more more reputable companies that are trying to make a name for themselves, that are licensed plumbers, they're going to start steer away from this just because you always, if you're worried about the customer and wanting the customer to be satisfied, you don't want them drinking salty water, you don't want them with lower water pressure problems, so that you steer them away from something like this and move them to do something different. In the late 70s and early 80s, Autotrol was, uh, was developed. Autotrol came out with a 155 valve. I'm going to cover this, this faceplate because the faceplate is wrong. This is a newer faceplate, or newer timer motor, really. But the 255 valve was invented, and it was made, developed by a company called Autotrol Auto out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Its goal was to compete with this company, and they did an amazing job. They created a newer valve design that had a little bit better water pressure, used a flapper design versus a... Versus a uh, uh, you can't see it, but in here there's a um, piston. piston design. So here a piston rotates back and forth, and as it rotates back and forth, it decides do I want to draw salt into the water softener 
or do I want to backwash it, which means it pushes water down the distributor. Again, this is the distributor. Forces the water out and up, and it helps release all the stuff that the, the softener has captured. It's not a filter, so you have to remember, a water softener is not a filter. It does ion exchange only, so if there's a particle in the water, it's not going to capture that particle. So you have to remember that. We don't call it a filter. It's a water softener. It uses ion technology. As this company evolved itself, it used these ports because they felt that the piston design would get gummed up because you have a piston going back and forth. And so they thought the flappers, as they control water going in and out of different ports that do the same thing, draw salt into the unit, backwash itself, and rinse itself, they designed this uh, flapper assembly to be easier to operate. One of the complaints about this valve is you actually have to spend a great deal of time to take out the piston, re take, take the seals apart, put a new seal on, and there's what's called spacers, and you have to put the spacers in there, and it's kind of tricky to do. So they felt that they, they could skin the cat by developing something that's easier to service, so they developed this control valve. It did very, very well. They grew and grew and grew. Uh, as they grew, they evolved their product from the 255, or the, excuse me, the 155, to what's called the 255. So I would say the 255 came out in uh, 2000. Is that about right? 2000? Late 90s. Late 90s into 2000. This 255 valve just changes the face a little bit. You notice the brine, the brine dial is on the front. They moved it to the side. They moved the screen and they made the screen and the injector a little larger ports to access. And uh, but the top plate is very similar. It sort of works on a cam. And again, the cam pushes on these uh, flappers, as you, can, you guys can see. So uh, it it was a much better service. It provided instead of a three-quarter inch distributor, it would work with a one-inch distributor. So the idea was that it would be better provide flow rates. It didn't do much to improve the rinsing of the filter material. It just really was a porting issue to try to get higher volume of water to go through it. And uh, they sold it to independent dealers, and they wouldn't sell it to really, at the time that it came out, they wouldn't sell it to wholesale or warehouse shops. So uh, companies like Angel jumped on board with both of these designs because we found them to service, be easier to service than the flat. So it really becomes personal issue of the owner or the main servicemen that are part of the team, which one did they really prefer. It might also be market driven, like in our market, maybe one of the larger competitors used this a lot, so you'd switch to this and try to sell that, and they're somewhat comparable. As far as, you know, the pricing and some of the features, again, this is a little bit slower rates. Fleck, uh, then because of that complaint about volume of water, they did introduce a newer unit that they said was one inch. It was a little bit more heavy duty. That was the other complaint, as you can see that they sort of beefed this guy up a little bit and made it a brass valve. Uh, and I'm not really sure of the timeline, to be very frank. I'm not sure if they came out similar at the time. Fleck made so many different products that it's hard to really say. But again, this was designed to be a one inch. It really truly isn't a full one inch as far as flow goes but it does a pretty decent job to compete with the 255. Did you say that, yes, yes. yes. So the 255 uh, valve, it is, this one happens to be a time clock. So this means that this is just like this unit, there is a time clock, which means as an expert, what we do is we first test the water, see the hardness of the water, calculate the iron that's in the water, then what we can do is we can say, okay, based on that and the filter material inside this tank, we can estimate how much water they're going to use before it needs to regenerate. So if I want this to go up every third day, I would push these pins in and pull the pins out for the next two days. So this would go off uh, one day, skip two days, and go off another day. Similarly here, if I want this unit to go off, I push the pin out. If I don't want it to go off, I push the pin in. So then it doesn't regenerate, it doesn't go through its cycle. We would size, we would calculate the volume of water based on how many people are in the house. So our average was 100 gallons per person per day. So we'd be able to do a mathematical equation based on how many gallons the number of people in the house would be using, use how much hardness is in the water and iron is in the water to help us decide how we were going to size these units 
so that we could achieve every uh, a day on and two days off at a very minimum. Uh, sometimes we try to shoot for a little bit more, but back in the 80s and the 70s and the 90s and early 2000s, salt was so cheap, it was like, oh, just size it whatever way, it doesn't really matter. You know, every other day, put it through there, who cares? And uh, what we've learned is the problem with that, again, if we go back to salt dosing, if we dose this over and over with extra salts, and it didn't need to be, then where is that going? It's going into the drinking water, but it's also going down the drain, because as these things clean themselves, remember they flush water down the drain. And they can run somewhere around 70 gallons of water down the drain. So what we found was is they were dumping a ton of salt down the drain. In fact, if you just do a simple math on this, if I go on vacation, and let's say we had this going off every other day, and it's going through 12 pounds of salt, uh, 12 pounds of salt, and this is a six day wheel, it means that within one week it's gone off three times, times 12 pounds of salt. That's 36 pounds of salt in one week. A bag of salt is 50 pounds or 40 pounds, and they run about nine bucks, 10 bucks. Now that's going down the drain. If I'm on vacation, it's going down the drain, and it's going into the sump pump, and it's going out into the earth, and then it's going out into the earth, and it's percolating back into the aquifer.